So welcome, this is the behavioral session. I'm Jan Drugas Pakitna. I work at the Institute of Pharmacology of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Krakow. I'm the head of the Department of Molecular Neuropharmacology. So what am I doing here? Major part of our work is using behavioral models to study how drugs, especially psychotropic drugs, affect behavior of animals. And this became popular already in the 30s and has only further developed since. Now, from the last decade or maybe two decades, it became possible to monitor the behavior of animals, but also to, when tests are performing humans, to monitor their behavior with a resolution that was unthinkable before. We can collect essentially any amount of data from the experiments and then we ended up with the problem, we don't know how to analyze it. And this is the reason I am here, and I will have the pleasure to introduce people who are solving this problem of how to extract from a large data set of behavioral data useful information. And we have... We have the distinct pleasure to have as our first speaker Professor Rafał Bogacz, who is the head of the Models and Brain Decision Networks Laboratory at the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences of the University of Oxford. And I will not be taking further time. Please, Rafał. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, so I would like to first thank the organizers for the uh, invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. So I would like to start this session uh, with uh, dis discussing simple behavior for which the neuroinformatics challenges connected with data analysis have been already a subject of work for several years. Uh, in particular, I will focus on uh, choice processes, which are common element of many different experimental paradigms. Uh, to understand the choice behavior, computational models have been developed which describe the decision process and automatic tools based on these models uh, help to automatically uh, uh, analyze um, and bring insight on, from behavioral data. Furthermore, these models can also form a bridge between behavioral data and neurobiology. So I will start with a brief review of neural basis of decision making. And then I will present the most influential model of choice process called the diffusion model. Uh, next, I will highlight the importance the software tools played in um, making the diffusion model widely used and accessible. Uh, present two uh, applications, two recent applications of this model, and if there is some time, discuss challenges. So the neural basis of uh, choice processes have been established in a paradigm in which a monkey is presented with a stimulus consisting of a cloud of moving dots. Uh, in the stimulus, fraction of dots moves coherently uh, right on some trials and left on other trials, and other dots are moving randomly. And the task of the animal is to make an eye movement uh, in the direction uh, of the majority of the dots. But because of the uh, noise in the stimulus, this task is not trivial and requires looking at the stimulus for some time. Neural activity has been recorded uh, during this task from several brain regions. And for example, this graph shows uh, activity of a sample neuron in uh, area MT, uh, of, which is part of the visual cortex. In area MT, neurons are selective for a particular direction of motion. And this graph shows activity of neuron preferring motion to the right. And the dark li line shows the activity on the trials when the majority of dots is moving to the right, while the light line when the majority of the dots is moving to the left. So you can notice that the dark line is above the light line. Uh, so these neurons provide some information which could be used to solve this task. But this activity pattern is very noisy because the stimulus itself is very noisy. So let us now think how the rest of the brain can make a decision on the basis of the activity of these empty neurons. So imagine that these are the empty neurons selected for leftward motion, and these are the empty neurons selected for rightward motions. Both populations produce spikes which could be interpreted as votes for these two uh, alternatives. So the brain needs to choose an, uh, an option which gets more votes um, or has a uh, higher mean firing rate. But please note that the brain cannot just measure mean firing rate instantaneously. It just listens to, this, to the spikes. So it has to listen to the spikes for a period of time 
integrate evidence until we reach a certain level of confidence and only then make a choice. And indeed, neural correlates of such integration processes have been observed in this task in lateral intraparietal area or LIP. So the, neurons in a, uh, so the LIP is involved in controlling eye movements and the uh, neurons in LIP have preferred directions of uh, eye movements. And this graph shows activity of a sample neuron preferring eye movements to the right. The solid lines show activity on trials when the monkey eventually makes uh, eye movement to the right. And you can notice that these lines gradually increase with time, which suggests that this neuron integrate evidence uh, over time, so essentially count the votes for right uh, during this decision process. Uh, the idea that these neurons integrate evidence is also consistent with the fact that the slope of these lines depend on the uh, uh, amount of information in the stimulus. And it's highest for the easiest trials when there is a large fraction of dots moving coherently. And on these trials, there's a lot of information which can be quickly um, um, integrated over time. Additional insights um, on the um, decision process can be brought by presenting the same data but locked to the moment of response. So first, if you um, uh, look at these traces, they look very similar for all conditions, which suggests that these neurons integrate information until it reaches a certain threshold, and when this threshold is reached, the choice is being triggered. Secondly, the dashed lines show activity on trials when the monkey makes eye movement to the left, so it chooses the option which competes with the option for which the neuron uh, is uh, selected for. And this um, um, traces decay with time, which suggests that when, the neuron, when these neurons lose competition during the decision process, they actually decrease their activity. So uh, this suggests that these neurons do not simply count votes for its corresponding option, because if this were the case, these neurons would also increase activity. Uh, but rather, these neurons represent the difference or the relative evidence for one option versus another. Uh, to account for this data, several models have been proposed, and the, one of the uh, simplest models is shown here. So it includes two populations of sensory neurons, selected for direction of motions, and two populations of these integrator uh, neurons, selected for different choices. Uh, in this graph, um, arrows denote excitatory connection, and lines ending with circles denote inhibitory connections. So these neurons integrate the difference between the evidence supporting the two options over time. So let us denote the mean activities of the sensory neurons by mu1 and mu2, and the uh, current activities of these integrator neurons by x1 and x2. Uh, so we can describe the dynamics in this model mathematically. Uh, so the model assumes that at the start of the choice process, we initialize uh, both integrators to a level which is halfway uh, from baseline to the decision threshold, so that I will denote the decision threshold by A. And during the, the choice process, uh, the dynamics of these integrators is described by these differential equations. So it changes proportionally uh, to the difference in the mean activity of the inputs and is also disturbed by noise, which I denote by epsilon. And the choice is made whenever activity of any of the two population uh, reaches a threshold, A. So let me now uh, um, describe how um, the, this model can be reduced um, to a, a canonical model of decision-making known as the diffusion model. So this graph shows simulation of the model from the previous slide, and the activities of two integrated population over time is shown in green and red. So you can notice that these two uh, integrators evolve in opposite way because they just get opposite inputs. And whenever uh, one of the uh, population reaches the threshold, the other must decrease to zero because they start half the way to the threshold. Therefore, uh, to describe this decision process, you really don't need to keep track of both of these integrators, but it's sufficient to just keep track of one of them. And indeed, in this diffusion model, which is the canonical model for decision making, uh, you consider only a single integrator, which integrates the difference between evidence for the two options, and the choice is made when uh, this, the value of this integrated evidence hits one or the other threshold. And this model is called diffusion because this particle kind of evolves in time as the uh, particle um, diffusing in the, on, in the water uh, with current. Uh, 
So let me describe um, this model formally. So um, in the diffusion model, um, we denote by x the integrated input uh, for the option which is correct on the given trial. Um, and this integration is driven by the equation, um, the differential equation, so the integrated evidence uh, increases with a certain rate, which is called the drift rate, and denoted by v, and there is some noise. Uh, the diffusion model also assumes that there is a delay between the onset of the stimulus and the time the information reaches the neural integrators, which is denoted by T0. So uh, the activity of this uh, integrator neurons is set to the uh, baseline until this time. And then the choice is made whenever uh, the integrated value reaches one of the two thresholds. So this graph shows simulation of the diffusion model on three trials. And in the simulation, the drift is positive. So on majority of the trials, uh, the model reaches the upper boundary, which corresponds to the correct choice. But on some trials, due to noise, it may reach the bottom boundary, which corresponds to an error. So in summary, the basic diffusion model is described by three parameters, uh, drift, uh, threshold, and non-decision time. And this uh, version is known as pure or easy diffusion to distinguish it with, from slightly more complex version with more parameters which are also being used. So it's often of great interest to estimate the parameters of this uh, model from behavioral data um, because they kind of provide the insight on the underlying decision process. So for example, the drift rate um, tells you how much information the brain receives per unit of time, which can be used in decision making while the threshold parameter uh, informs how carefully participants um, consider their information be before committing to a choice. And these parameters can be extracted from behavioral data describing the accuracy, which is the fraction of the correct responses, and the reaction time uh, across trials. So, so this is a picture of a typical uh, reaction time distribution, uh, which was taken from a moving dots task from human participants. And these parameters of the diffusion model can be identified from these behavioral measures because different parameters have different effects on the behavioral measures. So let me illustrate this dif differential eff effects with this slide. So here you can each dis here each displays um, illustrates simulation of a diffusion model where you can see trajectories of different trials and then resulting reaction time distribution for the correct and for error trials. And each column corresponds to change in a different parameters. So let me just go from the right side. So here you can see uh, what happens when you increase the non-decision time. So this just shifts the distribution of reaction time, but doesn't change their shape or the fraction of the correct choices. Uh, increasing the uh, decision threshold uh, reduces the number of errors. So you can see the red distribution diminishes. But uh, reaction time become longer um, and more um, variable. Uh, reducing drift also makes uh, reaction time longer and more uh, variable, but it actually increases the number of errors. So in summary, these changes in these different parameters have distinct effects on these uh, different measures, and therefore uh, the parameters can be recovered from these measures. So the diffusion model could be viewed as a tool which essentially converts raw behavioral measures into parameters describing, describing underlying um, decision process. To extract these parameters, um, you know, we need to have a method. Um, and many of such methods have been developed. I mean, let me just tell a few words about them. So, so when you de develop such a method, you have to ask f f several questions. So the first question is, you know, what objective function you want to optimize? Um, so you can, for example, uh, reduce the difference between behavioral measures and your uh, model behavior. Uh, you can increase um, the probability of your behav behavioral data given the model, so you can use some kind of probabilistic method. And these different uh, um, objective functions have been compared uh, through parameter recovery. So you can um, simulate data from the models, then use this optimization procedures to recover the parameters, and then you can see which procedures give the closest match between your true um, parameters uh, from which you generated the data and recovered values. And also, we have to uh, you know, consider what optimization procedure to employ. Before describing the methods currently available, I cannot stop myself from telling you how the parameters were extracted when I started work on models of decision-making in 2001. 
So at this time, these parameters were essentially found by hand. So a researcher simulated a model for a large number of trials and observed the, uh, the produced behavior for the model and then compared this behavior with the uh, data and uh, gradually adjusted parameters until uh, the two matched. Uh, so when I started my postdoc, um, I um, suggested to my uh, mentor, um, Jonathan Cohen, that maybe I could write a software which would automatize this proce procedure and find this parameter automatically. However, John was uh, not initially convinced because he felt that you know, to, un to find this parameter, you need to have this human insight uh, on the relationship between these parameters and resulting behavioral measures. But he was open to the idea that maybe you can find these parameters automatically, and he decided to test it experimentally. So he chose a particular uh, data set, he chose a particular model. This model was slightly more complicated than the diffusion model, but the details are not important. He let me develop my uh, automated software tool, and he also asked undergraduate student to do his um, final project on finding the parameters manually. Yes. So this poor guy spent four months of his life just simulating this model and tuning parameters gradually until the model matches the data. And in the end, after four months, he actually produced better parameters than my automated tool. But on the other hand, we developed this tool which um, uh, you know, was able to find um, parameters for any model which was described by a MATLAB function for, to, uh, to match with any behavioral data. So the tool which we developed was kind of useful first step. However, the real change in the applicability of this decision-making models was brought by software tools which were very easy to use. So first such tool, uh, FastDM, um, by Voss and Voss, uh, is really easy to use indeed. You just provide the data and it gives you the, back the parameters of the diffusion model. Uh, and this software tool allowed diffusion model to be used by people without the background in computer simulations. Since then, many other tools have been developed, and um, my favorite uh, is the hierarchical drift diffusion model from the lab of Michael Frank. Uh, and it assumes that the parameters of the diffusion model for individual participants come from distributions with certain mean and variances, and this toolbox extracts this kind of group level parameters. Uh, and uh, because of this, it's particularly useful in situations where there is few trials per participant. And to illustrate the impact this uh, software tools had, uh, I'm showing here the number of citations of the paper introducing diffusion model. So nowadays is cited almost daily, but actually for many years since its um, publication it had very little impact. And I would like, just like to illustrate that the number of citations of this paper just was dramatically, dramatically increasing after the tools have been developed. And these tools not only increase the access accessibility of this um, um, model, but also uh, increase the repro reproducibility of the uh, analysis. So initially, the diffusion model was used in purely behavioral studies. But with time, the neuroscientists started to employ it to un understand the neural basis of decision making. Um, and um, there are two main approaches of linking this model with neurobiological data. The, the first approach is to look how the parameters of diffusion model change by various manipulations, such as electrical stimulation, pharmacological manipulations, or how the parameters correlate with various features of the brain, such as anam ana ana anatomical features, disease state, or genetic variations. And more recently, another approach has been developed uh, which um, tries to um, understand the dependence on the parameters on neural activity. So let me uh, describe two studies which uh, use these two approaches. So recently I had pleasure to uh, help fit the diffusion model in an experiment investigating uh, des uh, decision making in insects. So um, my colleague Garo Misenbock and his group developed this really cool paradigm allowing to look at the decision processes in the fruit fly. So the fruit fly is placed in a tube um, where the two ends uh, are filled with a different concentration of odor which have been previously associated with electric shock. And when the fly enters this kind of uh, intermediate decision zone where there's a gradient of odor, it has to decide where to go. Um, and um, so you can get behavioral measures, so you can get an accuracy whether uh, the um, uh, 
fly actually went into direction with a smaller concentration of this odor. And you can measure reaction time, which is the time from entering to exiting this um, uh, decision zone. Furthermore, similarly as, this, as in the moving dots task, you can um, parametrically manipulate difficulty by changing the relative concentration of odor in the two ends uh, of the tube. Um, and so here you can uh, see the behavioral data from the fruit flies, which show the same patterns which you usually see in humans. So in particular, as you make the task more difficult by making the concentrations more similar, uh, the accuracy of the choice decreases and the reaction time uh, increases. And in this study, uh, Lukas Groschner uh, compared the behavior of control uh, flies with mutants uh, in the, uh, who had mutation in FOXP genes, which are shown in purple. And these mutants had the same accuracy, uh, but they had uh, increased reaction times on difficult trials. Um, so we analyzed this behavioral data with a diffusion model. So we used slightly more complicated version than the one which I described. And one of the parameters which was different um, between the mutants and controls was the drift rate, which was smaller in mutants. Um, so how we, can we understand the, where this small um, drift rate comes from? So Lucas also managed to investigate the neural basis of uh, decision making uh, in this task. And he found uh, that there are neurons which also represent the uh, integrated evidence um, in the fruit fly brain. However, here, uh, these neurons do not represent the integrated evidence in their firing rate, but in the membrane potential. And furthermore, his data suggests that when the membrane potential of these neurons reaches a threshold, then the fruit fly starts to move in the corresponding direction. So due to reduced size of the fruit fly brain, the whole choice machinery is compressed to a size of a single cell. Now, Lucas also noticed that the uh, mutants had higher concentration of leak channels. Uh, and to understand the role of these leak channels, you can kind of compare the evidence in integration during choice process to a um, butter which is being filled with water, which, where the water corresponds to the evidence. And then different leak channels would correspond to essentially hole in the bucket. So you can imagine that if you make more holes in the buckets, then the rate of uh, accumulation of water in this bucket will increase, which is basically consistent with a um, uh, reduced drift rate observed in these mutants. So in summary, in the study, um, the diffusion model allowed to link subcellular properties of single neurons with the choice behavior of entire animal. So in this previous study, um, we used a classical way of um, employing the diffusion model where we um, checked how the parameters differ between different conditions. Um, but there's also a new exciting approach which was uh, developed in this um, toolbox which uh, allow to look how the parameters depend on neural activity. Let, so let me explain this, this, this method on the base of the trestle. So, so um, you can measure uh, some uh, neural activity for a particular part of the brain, and, and you can look if this neural activity correlates across trials with a parameter of the diffusion model, such as threshold. So you would then assume that threshold is a linear function on a neural, uh, of the neural activity on a particular trial. And then uh, instead of finding the threshold parameter itself, you find these coefficients a and b for which the choice behavior on individual trials is best predicted by neural activity. Um, and um, we used this, um, this approach in a study um, investigating the neural mechanism of setting the decision threshold in the brain. And this was done in collaboration with a group of my colleague, Peter Brown. Um, previous research have, uh, has suggested that uh, decision threshold is um, one of the parts of the brain involved in control of the, of the height of the decision threshold is the subthalamic nucleus, um, or STN. So um, my colleague Damian Hertz recorded activity of STN um, from um, um, patients um, with Parkinson's disease who had electrodes uh, implanted into STN for clinical reasons. Um, and in this task, uh, the patients were asked to perform the, the moving dots um, task and to further manipulate um, the decision threshold. On some trials, they were asked to be accurate, while on other trials, they were asked to be fast. And then um, we can um, now 
look what are the um, candidate uh, neural signatures of these changes in, um, in the decision threshold. So we can compare the um, frequency of different oscillations in the local speed potential recorded from subthalamic nucleus in the speed and accuracy condition. And we observe that indeed there is a difference in the, local, uh, in the low um, frequency oscillations. So then we uh, fitted a diffusion model in which we assume that the threshold on a given trial is a linear function of this low frequency activity in the SDN. Uh, and then um, we fitted a model which instead of having uh, threshold parameters had a parameters describing the kind of intercept and slope of this relationship for the two conditions. And then on the, on the base of this we can estimate the relationship between the neural activity and the threshold which is shown here. So our analysis suggests that indeed the threshold depends on this low frequency oscillation in the subthalamic nucleus but only when the uh, participants were asked to be accurate but not when they were asked to be uh, fast. So there is, this is kind of me mechanism which is specific only to trying to be accurate but not to trying to be fast. Um, so let me just uh, say a few words about the um, um, challenges connected with data analysis. So when we use more complex versions of the diffusion model or uh, which have additional parameters uh, which can describe other aspects of the choice process, it's no longer so easy to identify them uniquely. Um, furthermore, diffusion model is only one of the models proposed for decision making. There are other models which fit the data equally well. So on the basis of the behavioral data alone, it's not always possible to identify the underlying decision processes and looking in the brain is really necessary. Um, so in this talk, I focused on tasks uh, um, which are kind of highly practiced, but a lot of interest um, in, in behavioral research and computational neuroscience is uh, on learning. And for um, learning task, the models or the, the, the automatic tools are not as developed as for this, div uh, for this uh, choice processes. And I think that one of the reasons is that there's a larger variety of different um, models which are suitable for different tasks. So the, so the models are not as standardized. And I, but I still think that's really important direction to develop these tools for fitting reinforcement learning models as well and to integrate reinforcement mo learning with diffusion model. So let me summarize the talk. Um, so I presented the diffusion model, uh, which is a tool which translates the behavioral data to parameters uh, describing the underlying choice process. And it also allows identifying neural correlates of these processes. Um, so I want to say that um, this work was uh, done together with uh, Jonathan Cohen from Princeton and my collaborators from Oxford. And finally, I would like to advertise the data sharing platform from our uh, Institute in Oxford, where you can download uh, various data sets, um, um, brain atlas, and uh, different tools for data analysis. Thank you very much. Now the talk is open for discussion. Thank you, Eva Gudowska. Uh, your talk provoked me a little bit because mm -hmm. you talked about the diffusion model and I would like to ask you what do you know about the noise which you incorporate into the model because I think the mo noise is crucial. Yes. Your model is not that diffusion model, it's a continuous time random work known in yes. mathematics. Okay. So, so, the, so the noise is really interesting, so let me just go back to the equation and explain um, it. So it's a, it's a great question. So uh, in this uh, uh, standard version of the diffusion model, uh, you people add noise, which is a Gaussian noise with unit variance. Yes? And uh, one could say that actually um, this noise could be parameterized itself, that you know, in different trials, uh, different tasks, you have different amounts of noise. However, people in standard diffusion model don't include these additional parameters, because if you include a parameter here, then it's no longer possible to uniquely identify this noise parameter, drift rate, and the threshold. And the reason for this is that if you scale all these three parameters by a constant, the choice behavior will not change. Yeah? So if you scale the threshold, drift rate, and noise, it's just like corresponds to stretching this, this uh, 
uh, this picture. So the reaction time distribution and accuracy will not change. So for simplicity, people just set noise to a constant. Yes. And however, um, people sometimes use those. In fact, in this um, study with the fruit flies, um, I just, you know, for simplicity, just describe just one of the parameters which we fitted. But uh, if you try to uh, fit a standard diffusion model to this data, you cannot fit this data just with changes in drift. You need to change drift and threshold. But we knew from the neurobiology that changing threshold doesn't make sense in these mutants uh, because uh, they initiate the movements when the spiking threshold uh, is reached and the spiking threshold is the same in the mutants. So, uh, so we looked for other parameters and in, in fact we found that, that we can explain this data by changing the drift and the noise. Um, and essentially the, the, the mutants have smaller drift and smaller noise and that's why the accuracy doesn't change. This is the property of the, of the diffusion model that if you rescale drift and noise by the same amount uh, the accuracy will not change. And then we can look at the uh, traces of the um, membrane potential as a function of time and indeed we found that the uh, variability of these traces was uh, reduced in the fruit flies. So, so we, we could see uh, changes in the noise level uh, in the neural recordings as well. So I'm afraid this the point we have to cut the discussion short, although I hope there would be more questions. I would like to thank again our speaker, Rafał Bogacz.